You're listening to the Cycling Podcast Femina, brought to you by iWalker. Flexible loans built for small businesses. Join 50,000 customers taking on life's twists and turns and scaling new heights with iWalker. If you run a business, find out more at iwalker.co.uk. That's i w o c a.co.uk. Well, quite extraordinary levels of professionalism in the uh, build-up to this August episode of the Cycling Podcast Femina. My name's Richard Moore. I'm with professional Rose Manley. Oh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi. And uber professional Orla Shinoui. <laughs> hello, hello. I thought you were going to go for the uh, contrast there. I thought it was going to be unprofessional Orla Shinoui. So thank you. Hello. Good evening. Yeah, now I feel like I've been overshadowed and I was quite happy before. <laughs> What he gives with one hand, Rose, he slaps you in the face with the other. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, we we got it. We got we're here. We're here. We got we got it working in the end. Orla, you're you're coming to us crystal clear from a campsite in Denmark. Yes, at last, at last. It's only taken us thirty four minutes to get this far into our chat. What with Wi Fi <laughs> issues, four G issues, headphones, blah blah. Not all mine, I should say. But jokes yes. falling flat. <laughs> mm. I am in another campsite in Denmark as I continue my merry little summer holiday um, in our camper van. <laughs> the chaos continues, the chaos roadshow. You've been at Legoland? We have been at Legoland for two whole days. Can you imagine anything more wonderful? Whoa. Um, no. It's actually Whoa. been bloody brilliant. I love it. I love Legoland. <laughs> Sad but true. We've had wait a lovely minute, time. Wait a minute, all at... Orla, you need to stop because Rich is about to make a joke. Oh, yeah, so it's you've not got a, a joke, it's a question. You've got a Lego no, joke. No, I've got a joke. I've got a question. Do they have a little uh, Lego, Lego figurine figurine of Cecilia Utrecht Ludwig there? What? what? Well, <laughs> Den- Denmark's is that a top question? female cyclist. <laughs> uh, Mads Pedersen, Cecilia no. Utrecht Ludwig. No, I'm afraid not. I actually looked in the Lego shop earlier, which is a massive, it's like a mega store, a Lego mega store. And um, I battled for about one hour going around the shop trying to find a little Lego figurine of a cyclist and I couldn't find one. So I left no. sadly empty handed. There were lots of racing cars. There was a little ski set. Um, but yeah, absolutely none on bicycles that I could find. But very odd, given that we're not in even a little, that is shocking. A, a little bald Bjarne Reese. No, nothing like that. <laughs> no, no, maybe it was an early um, version Bjarne Reese with hair. Maybe that's why I didn't recognize it. But no, no two wheels whatsoever. I'd have thought, I could find or Brian Holm or so- somebody. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad you're having a good time. And uh, Rose, you're back from Italy. Yes, I'm in, back in beautiful tooting, beautiful, sweaty, hot tooting. You got your you got your your wet flannel beside yeah, you. Yeah, I've got a little um, flat flannel in a dish. <laughs> it's actually I've actually just noticed actually that the flannel actually um, is losing its colour. So it's maybe um, cooking in its own juices by now. That's the problem yeah. when they get warm and then the what? Yeah, maybe not so good. If things Horrible, if things get I'm, desperate yeah. and you start slapping yourself around the face with a look warm uh, flannel, we'll know that uh, we should up our banter game, Richard. Yeah, or just, Absolutely. I think it's time to finish then. Just hang it? up. Should we stop? Just... Should we stop already? <laughs> yeah, I think let's just... Rose Manley has left this call. <laughs> um, well, listen, it's been a long month since uh, the last episode of the Cycling Podcast Femina, hasn't it's it? It's been a long um, month since we started the podcast, it feels like already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah no, that's true. July's episode came out last week in early August, and this is August's episode. Um, there hasn't actually been any, any racing, so... We're going to cast forward a little bit in this episode and pick a few things that we're looking forward to. We're also going to hear from Lizzie Dagnan um, about the return to racing and what she's looking forward to. And then at the end, a little update from Bob Varney and his team drops his search for a sponsor. Um, but do you have a little news roundup for us, Orla? I do. I've got a mini, tiny 
Pucci news roundup. So um, let's go with it. The fight is on to secure the signature of Annemiek van Vluten, if rumours are to be believed. We mentioned in the last podcast last month, i.e. last week, um, reports that Jumbo Visma had wanted to sign the world champion alongside Mariana Vos for their new squad next year. And the latest team to add grist to the rumour mill is Movistar. Van Vluten, uh, of course, took a pay cut to stay with Mitchelton Scott this year, along with the rest of the riders in the COVID crisis. But she hasn't re-signed for them. She has made it clear that she's talking to other teams. And the rumour is that Movistar are the latest to be interested. They have been busy making signings um, aside from that with Emma Norsgaard committing to the Spanish team for the next two seasons. The Danish sprinter and time trialist currently rides for Equipe Paul Ka and her brother Matthias rides for the men's at Movistar squad making it a family affair and the first time I understood that I understand rather that we've got a brother and a sister riding on the same squad. I mean I guess it would be there aren't very many of them. Uh, Rose you look like I don't know that that's well I think that Annette Edmondson and her brother Used to ride on the same squad. Oh, did they? Well, I stand corrected. I don't know though. Oh Google, God! Google. Quick! I've only got a one. Ah! I've, I've got one last bit of news round up today. You're going to have. Oh to my God! Like okay. Giggling. Um. So stand by for corrections corner, listeners. That should be exciting. Um. The tour of Guanxi then has gone the same way as the Bowls Ladies Tour and has been cancelled because of COVID. And that is your slightly incomplete news roundup as we wait for Rose to oh, confirm I'm, or deny. I'm, that was way too quick. All that. I literally. <laughs> Well, well, I've maybe, typed in maybe, Annette so Maybe far. you shouldn't be so quick to butt in then, eh, Rose? <laughs> <laughs> just if you got if there's something wrong, just keep quiet. All right. We no, will clarify, clarify that by the end of the podcast. <laughs> by the end of the podcast, that will be clarified. Right. A little update to the news roundup. Just after we recorded this episode came the news we'd been expecting that the World Championships in Aigle and Martigny in Switzerland have been cancelled due to the rule in Switzerland that major events with more than a thousand visitors are not permitted until the 30th of September. The UCI say they are working towards finding a solution to ensure that the 2020 World Championships can take place, with their priority being in Europe and at the dates initially scheduled, that's from the 20th to the 27th of September. You are listening to the Cycling Podcast Femina, brought to you by iWalker, flexible loans built for small businesses. Join 50,000 customers taking on life's twists and turns and scaling new heights with iWalker. If you run a business, find out more at iwalker.co.uk. That's iwoca.co.uk. Thank you very much to our title sponsor, iWalker. They support the cycling podcast Femina and we're very grateful to them. Uh, go to iwalker.co.uk if you run a small business and want to know what iWalker can do to help you. Uh, and you'll see a link from there to their reviews on Trustpilot. They've got nearly 4,500 reviews there and an overall rating of excellent. 90% of reviewers give them five stars for excellent. 7% give four stars for great and many of those reviews if you read them praise the customer service and in particular the fact that i walk up they speak to and deal with actual people um so that is something that people obviously appreciate and uh, yeah if you run a small business and you're interested in finding out what kind of support um i walk can offer go to i and thanks again to them for supporting the cycling podcast. Now, we heard your news run up there, Orla, just on Annemiek van Vluten. I mean, she looks and is performing better than ever this year, um, but she's 36 now, um, and at some point, you would think, will start to not perform at that level. If you were a team, what you know, what sort of contract would you offer her? Would you... Would you would you give her a couple of years? Do you think that she's going to still be at the top for the next couple of years? I guess that's a fairly safe bet, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you'd give Annemiek van Vluten whatever contract she wanted, nearly. She, she may be, you know, in theory, getting to the stage where she should be starting to slow down a little bit. But when a rider is showing absolutely no signs of it, and, you know, she's never won... She's never been on a winning streak like she is on at the moment since she won the World Championships. I mean, that is a pretty incredible way to wear the rainbow jersey. So it's not like there's any chink in her armour. And the way she's winning races has not diminished. It's only improved. So I would say, okay, fine, if you're going to talk about, you know, 
the human condition and, and what should be happening in terms of her ageing, but it's simply not at the minute. I would be giving her whatever she wanted. She's the, she is the biggest winner in cycling. Correct, Shikora. I'm going to correct myself quicker than Rose. She's 37. So she'll be <laughs> she'll be thirty eight in October. She'll be thirty eight in October. But but you'd be a fit, but what would you do? You sign her for one year? Well, no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. She, she's I mean, talking to several teams. I'm being very ageist here. Obviously, there, there's yeah, yeah. There, there is absolutely no reason as in a, the as world why. As an aging why. woman, I object. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do. I do think that we also should kind of readjust what our thoughts are because about people over about women specifically over thirty, um, because I think it's scientifically proven that women do better at an uh, older age than compared to men. But also, I mean, I looked at Strada Bianchi last, um, when was that, last week or whenever it was, last two two weeks ago, and I think it was like eight out of the top ten were over 30. It was only, so, I mean, the people who were under 30 were way, way, way in the minority. So, so I think we kind of, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, how old um, Anna Meek is and how old Mariana Voss is, although, you know, Mariana had kind of a lot more success when she was younger. Um, but I think we need to kind of change our perception of that uh, and see that actually the riders that are over 30 seem to be the ones that are doing the best at the moment. And it's very clear with women's cycling in particular, it's just not having that same trend that men's is, you know, with, with ever younger winners. And the older some of these riders are getting, the better they are getting. You know, if you look at Strada Bianchi, Mavi Garcia is, what, 36? Um, and, as you say, Anamik, 37. So they are not bucking any trend. It's not like there is momentum behind them that's chasing them. They're the ones that are setting the trend. You know, the older riders are winning. It's experience and maturity and, and years and kilometres under the belt that's actually being rewarded with race wins. Um so they're not actually being unusual at all. That's that's the current fact and face of women cycling. Yeah, I think also it is a case of the development as well because in women's racing there isn't that under twenty three category. You know, you go from the juniors and then you're expected to perform once you're too old to be in the juniors and you're still a teenager and you're expected to perform uh, with the pros. Then that's going to take several years to build up your conditioning, to build up your race experience. And she clearly thrives on you know mega miles lots of endurance in her training and endurance is something that that's the last thing to go isn't it she's not a sort of power rider or an explosive rider she's a she's an endurance athlete and she that's the training that she does and that's what seems to um get her the into the the sort of condition that she's in now And and it's so interesting that okay she was going well before lockdown but that coming out of lockdown she's she's absolutely flying because i think that you know putting in the miles in that period wouldn't have been uh, it would have been a pleasure rather than a chore for her as we heard in the episode that we did on her a couple of episodes ago her coach louis de High has said that she built up to this level of training and that, you know it's something that she she enjoys thoroughly um so Ignore my question. I would sign her for a four year, at least four years. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I would give her what she wanted. Truly, four years. I would say it's not inconceivable that she'll still be at. Yeah. she'll be at the top for another four years. It's possible. Well, apart from anything else, if she's got contracts to choose between, she's going to go with whichever one she wants. Oh yeah. You know, if she if she's if that's so true. A team is going to offer her four years, and that's what she thinks is going is going to be best for her. Then then. That's got to be on the table. Someone's got to be offering that, you know, you'd expect. I don't, know, I don't think cycling contracts are long like that anymore, though, are they? No, well, not, except yeah. now, now at least in the Women's World Tour, they, they, they have to have the guarantee. Um, so obviously mm. now each of the teams are one year into that guarantee, but the, the, the World Tour teams have to be more steady. And maybe that will then lead to longer contracts um, and, and I think a in team the side of it, like maybe. Movistar or Jumbo Visma would both be more than able to offer contracts of that length if they wanted to i tell you what we know that um Anamik likes a good listen to the cycling podcast feminine maybe she'll get in touch and put us out of our misery how many years Anamik? tell us well <laughs> who are you she's going probably stopped listening because richard bangs on about her age all the oh, time <laughs> oh dear um anyway uh, spring listen. chicken richard oh come on <laughs> um yeah anyway um, <laughs> she wasn't very happy about uh, the course for La Course by the Tour de France, which we'll talk about soon. But before we do, let's hear from Lizzie Diagnan, shall we? One of the riders that returned to racing, of course, uh, when it resumed in Spain recently and then carried on to Strada Bianca, where she had a bit of bad luck. 
Um, but she rides for Trek Segafredo, of course. The Olympic Games were a, a huge target for her this year, and you felt like they were a big reason for her coming back after having her, her baby, Orla. Um, and uh, with the Olympics postponed, I wondered you know, what her plans were for next year's job because she currently um, is out of contract at the end of the year, so I don't know if she'll carry on with Trek Segafredo. Um, but here is what Lizzie Dagnan had to say about the first races back and the ones to come. How are you? I mean, back back racing. Um, how did you find those those first few races? Uh, definitely a shock to the system. Um, and I was just a bit unlucky. Like, I got food poisoning in the first few races in Spain, and then I crashed in Strada. So it was a bit of an anticlimax, kind of working really hard all through lockdown to, mm. <laughs> to finally get the chance to race, and then that happened. But um, it was nice to be racing. A bit surreal, but it was good. How did you find the lockdown? I mean, you know, the, I know the Olympics were a big target for you when they were postponed. Did that take the wind out your sails a bit or are we able to to knuckle down and keep working hard no i think it was it was fairly easy to keep a perspective on it that it was just sport and you know the right decision was made i think i think it actually it's kind of like a delayed feeling of now i'm racing again i'm like right okay yeah i've got to keep doing this until november now (laughs) um so yeah i think it it will just take its toll the longer the season goes on really were there any positives for you i mean some people have spoken about you know things that they they learned or were able to do in that period that they wouldn't have done otherwise i mean i know you went back back home to england were there were there was there anything about it that that you enjoyed i'm thinking you know time with your daughter perhaps yeah i really enjoyed really lots of quality family time all developed loads in the lockdown period she kind of went from being a baby to a little person so i'm glad that i didn't miss out on any of that and i think it just made me grateful for the kind of life choices that i've made that i wasn't just sat on my own staring at a turbo and you know I'd got you know great husband and daughter and I just I just felt grateful for all the things that I did have really and I know I mean you look after your own training so how did you how did you structure that without uh you know for a lot of it there was no knowledge of when the next race would be no goal in sight how how did you how did you manage that uncertainty I took time off when I was gonna take time off anyway so my plan generally every season is do the spring classics then take a little break in may and start building up again so i followed that same trend but i did definitely back off um in terms of not doing the same amount of intensity not following my diet as strictly and things like that because um you can't maintain that sort of level of focus well i can't anyway without it having a negative impact on the the long season that we're going to have so what what next for you? What's next on your programme? Are you doing Plue? Uh, yes, yeah, so I actually I do a race that I've never done in Italy next week, Emilia. Um, and then I go to Plue, the Europeans, La Course, the Giro, Worlds potentially. I think we find out tomorrow if Switzerland is going to host the Worlds or not. So, yeah, I mean, mm. there's there's all these plans, but who knows? And, and I mean, Plue is a race you know well, of course. Um, but what of those races that are upcoming particularly appeal Plue, definitely the Europeans on the same uh, circuit, um, and La Course because it's it's kind of a home race. It's just down the road. Um, I've ridden those roads a lot, and it's going to be a big celebration, obviously, of, of cycling Tour de France just down the road. It's quite mm. exciting to be a part of that. And what do you think? I mean, there's been some some comment about the the course. What do you think about the the course this year? What kind of race are we going to see on that course? Do you know? I think it's actually. Um, a good course <laughs> a good racing course yeah I know Anna Meek was quite vocal about saying that it wasn't world tour level but I think this year of any year would have been easy for the you know the ASO to back out of having a women's race and I'm pleased that there is still a women's race and you know it's it's not suited to Anna Meek and I can understand why she's not over the moon about it but it's certainly suited to lots of other riders and I'm sure they'll be happy with it so yeah I, I think it's a good racers circuit I think it'll be quite um aggressive racing yeah that was that was my sort of impression as well um what uh, a lot of there was a lot of talk before racing resumed about you know there would be surprises there would be riders who we you know perhaps hadn't heard of who would who would have uh, you know, have have benefited from this period. Were there any surprises for you in the races that you've done? Any anything that caught you out? 
Um, I think Garcia was impressive in both Spain and in Strada Bianchi. Um, whether that was because she was able to kind of sneak under the radar a little bit in the way she, she raced. Um, maybe people will kind of pay more heed to her attacks now. But um, no, I think uh, th- there was no huge surprise. I think Anamik is not a surprise, but um, it's, I suppose, a bit surprising just how much stronger she is, it seems. She is, you know, extraordinary, uh, given that she's not getting any younger, but just seems to be getting better and better. What what do you attribute that to? Do you have any theories? I mean, we know about her training and she spends a lot of time at altitude and so on, but any, any ideas about how she's managing to get to and, and keep at that level? I mean, I don't know her personally, so I don't really know. Um, but obviously she she certainly puts in the hours and works very hard. She's, she's quite open with the, the level of training that she does. So certainly I'm not training to that level. I know even, you know, some of the male pros that I know aren't training to the same level as she is. So it's obviously working for her. I think I, I, I would be uh, probably in a box six feet under if I'd tried to emulate the same kind of training so yeah I think she's just a phenomenal athlete yeah I want to ask you about your team second year now with Trek Segafredo you know any new team has teething problems and you know a period of of sort of settling in how does the team feel now um does it feel like quite a a settled squad yeah it it feels really good um it was a real shame actually obviously anyway it was a shame that the season was cancelled at the start of the year but we really had a bit of momentum going the men had done really well they'd won some races in Mallorca and there was a really good kind of and Ruth had won the tour down under and it felt like we're you know on a bit of a high going into the season Mm. so it was disappointing that that kind of got stopped but yeah I feel very happy happy with the team and what about the future Lizzie I mean um what are your thoughts about next year and you know the Olympics next year is is it have you just moved that goal 12 months down the road or or what are your what are your what are your thoughts about it yeah at the moment that is where I'm at um but you know who knows (laughs) every day you kind of open the news and think what am I going to see today so I'm pretty open-minded and I suppose, yeah, flexible. I think you, you have to be at the moment. Shoot, uh, shoot at l'arrière du peloton. Cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. Well, that's the voice of Seb PK interrupting this episode of the Cycling Podcast Femina to remind me to tell you that it is sponsored by Whoop. Now, I've been joined by Lionel Burney from the other podcast. Hello, Lionel. Hello, Richard. Um, we've got you because you, like me, uh, have been wearing your Whoop. Whoop. Whoop is a fitness wearable that provides personalised insights on how recovered you are and how much stress you put your body through during the day um, so you can maximise your workouts and performance. But it also monitors your sleep and gives you a recovery score based on your sleep, your resting heart rate, your heart rate variability. Um, you wear this device on your wrist and it's it's monitoring your heart rate and um, gleaning a lot of information from that. And I mean, it, I've been wearing it for a week now and it is absolutely fascinating. How have you found yours, Lionel? Well, I've been really interested to see the kind of data that it has been gathering and, and, and seeing whether the way I feel... Uh, matches the the numbers and I'm, I can say that it does really um, my now legendary family camping weekend which if you listen to the regular cycling podcast you'll have heard about in this week's episode what really surprised me was that my sleep performance and recovery two nights of camping you know very quiet, quiet and peaceful um, relaxing of course and, and in a tent which was you know really well blacked out so um, you know I got myself a, what I felt was a decent night's sleep and the the numbers back that up um the the other side of the coin is the strain score which gives you a rough idea of how hard you've worked um throughout the day and so when i did a sort of 75 kilometer bike ride in really warm conditions i got the strain score really quite high i think i was uh, 17.9 for the day out of 21 now you can sort of say well that's a, a sort of arbitrary figure but it gives you an indication that you perhaps need to pay more attention to recovery um, and it kind of helps you quantify the efforts you're making and the recovery you are uh, managing to achieve which is something that you can do by feel but it gives you some guidance it kind of helps you along a bit i think what about you rich 
Yeah, I'm learning a lot about my sleep. I'm sleeping more than I think I sleep, strangely, and um, getting quality of sleep better than I thought I was getting. I, I've always been a bad sleeper, and um, th this is helping me to look at my <laughs> sleep a bit more positively. But it's also, you know, it connects with an app on your phone, and it gives you sort of recommended strain score for the day. So it kind of helps you um, decide whether to you know to go out on your bike that day for example and, and how hard to go and again I mean not to follow that to the letter but I find that sort of guidance quite helpful and um, you know it's a bit like having a coach on your on your wrist um, just as a, as a form of guidance I think it's it's great and uh, yeah as I say I'm really enjoying the insights into sleep in particular and it's motivating me to well the, the links between sleep and just you know uh, alertness and and feeling healthy um, are, are clear and uh, anything that helps you put a bit more emphasis on getting good sleep can only be a good thing I think so I'm enjoying it so far um, and Whoop is offering 15% off right now with the code cycle at the checkout go to Whoop that's w-h-o-o-p.com and enter cycle at the checkout save 15% Sleep better, recover faster, and train smarter. Optimise your performance with Whoop today. I can see this getting competitive when we're away covering the Tour de France, Richard. Uh, going, I'm going to bed at 8.15 tonight, Richard. No, no, I'm going to bed at 7.45. I don't, think, I don't think any of us will be going to bed at 8.15, but never mind. So that was Lizzie Dagnan uh, speaking from her home in Monaco. She spent a lot of lockdown back home in England um, riding... Her bike, you know, she was able to get outside there and, and train. Um, and I wonder, you know, it's 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 been interesting hearing from riders what, what they did in that period training-wise and how many of them liked the old indoor training and how many of them were getting out on the roads and how easy they found it to train for this this moving target of, of not quite knowing when racing was going to start again. Um, I think, you know, she's always been a good trainer, uh, Lizzie Dagen looks after that herself. Um, but with the added uncertainty of the Olympics, her big target for the year um, not happening and being put back a year, um, you know, I just wondered at her at her motivation, I suppose. Um, but she did say, spoke very warmly about her team and said that before lockdown she felt they were on a bit of a roll and it, and it was a real shame uh, that racing was interrupted because she felt that you know, in their second year, they kind of clicked as a as a team, and they were going to do great things this year. I mean, too early to say probably how well she's going. I said she was ill in Spain, and then she had a crash in uh, Strada Bianchi, so some bad luck there. Um, but what do you expect from Lizzie Dagnan in the in the races to come? I think it's I think it's too hard to tell, really. Um, we're still waiting to see what some riders have to offer after lockdown really and, and how that's affected them and I don't think we've seen enough from Lizzie because as you say you know she was ill and then she had that crash at Strada Bianchi um, and we just we I think I'm really curious to see with her um, what kind of what kind of um, end to her career she's going to have you know I would love to see her I mean, this is entirely personal. Um, and I've said this before, but just from a completely personal point of view and an inspiration point of view, I'd love to see her as a mum um, more than anything else. And she's a cyclist first and foremost. Well, she's not, I guess. She's a mum first and foremost. I don't know, whatever. Um, but I would love to see her winning and winning big races. Um, I'm not sure if we've seen enough yet to know whether that's going to be possible. And the, the problem that she has, that absolutely everybody has, is that we know that Annemiek van Vluten is beatable, but she just hasn't been beaten in such a long time. And to win a bike race, you've got to beat her. Um, I do think that um, Trek Sigafredo are showing really strong signs, and they've been good even since um, the reopening of races, you know, the, the recommencing of, of the season. You know, when you think at Strada Bianchi, their bikes were stolen the night before, and they still had two riders in the top 20, one in the top 10. Um, they've had strong results with Elisa Longo Borghini doing really well. Um, through all the races um, so the team seems to be doing well I just think we haven't seen enough of Lizzie really since I mean we know that, that she obviously can when we saw it at the women's tour um, but I, I just don't know 
what we can expect from her this season. Like with a lot of the riders, you just don't know what to expect from them. I think actually part of the what Lizzie Dynam might have a problem with trying to get results is exactly what you're talking about, Orla, in that the team are doing, so Trek Segafredo are doing so well and riders that actually have kind of a similar skill set to Lizzie uh, are doing probably better than she is. Like, you know, you know, she's on a team with Elisa Longo Borghini and Audrey Cordon Rigaud and uh, Ellen Van Dyke. And so it's very hard. All these riders are really great on one day races. And that is exactly what Lizzie Dynan is great at. Although she did win the women's tour, as you said, last year as well. Um, but I think it's very hard when you're on a team which is performing very well uh, and you have riders that are similar to you that are performing better than you to then get given the opportunity to really show yourself. Because I think since Lizzie came back, apart from the women's tour, she has been quite uh, quiet and been kind of finishing in the pack and you know been, not been putting herself um, out against the wind so much. So I think, yeah, uh, we'll have to see about kind of the changing fortune, fortunes of the team before we kind of see much of Lizzie Dynan I think and I'd like to see as well she's not the kind of rider you know with, with Van Vluten who, who tends to just you know peak and then just keep going um, Lizzie seems to do well when she targets specific races you know when, when, when she gives it a role and we see her whenever she's committed to a race the fight that she has in her is just brilliant to watch I love it you know even when she's she's the pressure is on her, I guess maybe when the pressure is on her, that's that's when she thrives the most. But she's got such a fighting spirit that is that is be- beautiful and brilliant to see. Um, that tends to be more for the races that she is targeting. So I think we need to wait and see what um, what races will be her target and see how she performs in those. I think that will be more of an indicator, really, because as you say, Rose, you know she she finishes she finishes well, but you know she's doing a team job a lot of the time. So. Um, which race she's going to be given more leadership in. We wait to see in which race, I guess it's, you know, which one she's going to be targeting as well. But once that happens, I think we'll have a fair idea as to um, how the, the last year or two of her career are going to pan out. Well, we gave ourselves the challenge, or Rose, you suggested that we give ourselves the challenge of each picking something to look forward to in this, uh, in this sort of condensed season ahead of us. Um, and... Uh, I was going to pick a race. Orla, I think you're picking a, a, a rider. And Rose, you've gone for a team. Uh, and Lizzie Dagnan leads me quite nicely into the one I'm looking forward to. Now, I was a bit torn here because we've got a first ever women's Pirate Bay. And I am, I am obviously, I think everybody's looking forward to that. It seemed a bit too obvious. Of course, I'm looking forward to the Women's Pirate Bay, um, another ASO event. We don't like to do obvious. No, exactly. Another. You're turning into Daniel Freeman. Oh, I mean, it's just a, the, 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 <laughs> this is just a further attempt to alienate uh, Annemiek van Vluten, uh, who tweeted her displeasure at La Course and the route that's been selected this year. Um, she tweeted, can't believe what I saw, a 96-kilometre race, only two laps with her third cat climb, not really world tour level. And helpfully, she's copied in UCI cycling to that tweet. That's good, just so they, <laughs> just just in case they miss it. But um, I think it, it I think it, it looks an interesting race, and not dissimilar to the um, the race in pole last year, the circuit in pole, which uh, Mariana Voss won, and that was a thrilling race on a, on a really sporting course. And I like the idea of a course that that we can look at and say that Annemiek van Vluten isn't necessarily going to win that because. If you make it really hard and very selective, then she will be an overwhelming favourite. This should be a much more open race. And we heard Lizzie Dagnan say how much she's looking forward to it. It should be, and we're, we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed here, of course, because so much still seems uncertain. But, you know, as we're speaking now, um, you'd be reasonably confident that that, that and the, the start of the Tour de France will go ahead. And for all the, the conditions are, you know, the, the crowd will be compromised and everything. I think it'll be a great occasion in Nice, which is a tremendous location anyway. Um, there should be, there will be people watching. There'll be a real, I think having the, the you know, the women's race on the eve of the, the Tour de France, the men's Tour de France is also, is also a, quite a good idea in a sense. I think it will be just when anticipation levels are really, really high and there'll be an appetite for this race. Um, and so I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll be exciting 
tactical, lots of really strong teams now. Um, so I think it'll be a really interesting race and with a potentially a surprising winner. Um, and I mean, we'll probably talk about Pirate Bay uh, in the next episode. But yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to La Course this year. Can I just ask all listeners when La Course comes around, can we please just just talk about the racing and how it's played out in the road? Can we please not give any tweet space or airtime or any attention to why there are no uh, why there isn't a women's Tour de France I just feel like it's this prime occasion isn't it whenever the racing as you say Richard it could be really thrilling it could be really exciting let's just talk about that please that's just a, that's just a personal plea well I'm sure that'll work Rosa. I'm sure that'll work Orla I, I think I, I, I think <laughs> my words I think, have weight I think, that, Richard. I think that'll put a stop to any <laughs> any 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 tweeting on I'm only right. asking our listeners oh, yeah. and I'm not, I'm not asking the whole world we're asking our listener jeez please listener I'm, I'm trying to... <laughs> yeah. Please, <laughs> mum. Please, mum. <laughs> don't, don't do your usual. Don't retweet the empty press room that's not really the well, empty Well, it'll be press social room. distancing, anyway, won't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but they'll still say it's only because it's a woman's race. <laughs> No, I was just going to say it is a um, it is a really intriguing course because it's incredibly short, isn't it? And it's just kind of two laps, a category three climb, so you can't see that there's much there. But you know, it would be enough for a breakaway to get away or to have a selective sprint at the end of it. And I was trying to compare it to I was trying to look at the climb and compare it to any other climbs that there are in cycling, but I don't really know that there's a comparable. There's been something that's quite comparable. It's kind of it's only five kilometers long. It's only five percent, so it's not it's not massive at all by any means. But it might actually make for an interesting selection. Yeah, it, it's it's quite grippy though, and I think the climb carries on beyond the sort of the KOM line. It, it it's it's tougher. There's this sort of false flat slash actual climb that carries on. So I think I would describe it as a sporting course, you know, which, which is what we had last year. And we had, I mean, what a race it was last year, wasn't it? Oh, it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. It was it was one of those races that you can say is truly thrilling, you know, where, where it felt like anything could happen. And it was that anything could happen until that final climb and the run into the line. It was absolutely brilliant racing. I'd love to see. But that one had a climb right yeah, at the end. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's right, true. But, right but, but you know, this if it's a selective not... sprint, that's still, that's still a brilliant mm. watch, isn't it? Yeah, I think like I saw that Chloe Hoskin is looking forward to it. I think Mariana Voss would be very is probably looking forward to it again as she does every race probably. And it could be one for Lizzie. It could be, yeah, which is why she's looking forward to it. And she knows the roads, as she said, very well. Just mm-hmm. um a little update on the plans ASO have for a women's race. We're not quite sure what it will be called. Um but it sounds like it's likely to be in August and it it may not happen next year. I think originally the plan was for it to, to launch next year, but I think COVID may have scuppered that. So they may be looking now at 2022, but I believe um, it's, it'll be a stage race in August, potentially starting the day after the men's Tour de France finishes uh, in Paris on the Champs-Élysées. Um, Is I'm the, not... um, the Scandinavian race, isn't that August? Pennsylvania it's August. also been postponed hasn't it the first running of that yeah but i mean like if they're when they get the calendar yeah when the calendar's all together how would that um well i'm asking you like you're the authority Rich, but I know. well i'm i'm contradicting i was told august but then you know i was also told that it could it could start the day after the men's tour de france which should actually still be in mm. july um you know and, and it can be the start of the final week in july or even a little bit earlier than that depending on when the 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 Tour de France starts and next year it'll start very early of course and so it sounds like end of July beginning of August I'm not sure the length of the race either whether it'll be one week or or 10 days I'm not sure um but but you know what would be really interesting with that is that you know we've or not we have but there's been a lot of clamour for a women's Tour de France for such a long time if if that happens and we've got the Giro Rosa and we've got Battle Battle of North, isn't it? There's no the in there, oddly. Uh, Battle of North. Um, then you've got to... There has to be a hierarchy there, surely, doesn't there? You know, which which one becomes the prestige race? Because 
I don't know, I guess, depending on the scheduling, um, whether you can double up on them, triple up on them, whatever. But is will well, they it sound be... incredibly close together? Mm, yeah. So will it be just because it is the woman's in, in inverted commas um, Tour de France that that will become the most prestigious, even if it's not yet? You know. Well, we'll return to that later in this episode, Orla. The cycling podcast Femina is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you to Science and Sport for their support of the cycling podcast Femina. You can get 25% off at Science and Sport with the code SISCP25, of course, at scienceandsport.com. No singing, please. Uh, Rose is dancing. So is Orla <laughs> now. SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. And I highly recommend the new Turbo Plus range with its menthol gels and menthol drink. I've been enjoying that in the hot weather it's designed for indoor training where it tends to be very hot but i can uh, i can tell you that it's great um outdoors too in this heat and i had an endorsement this week from none other than daniel freeb in fact on the on the other podcast the he other said he'd been uh, trying it he was very impressed very impressed very uh very refreshing taste in your mouth really does cool you down i recommend it Anyway, um, Rose, you picked a team that you're looking forward to seeing how they do. What what's, what team is that? I did. Um, Ale BTC Ljubljana. And it's at this point that I wish I hadn't been drinking this lager that I've been drinking. <laughs> um, but, yeah, they are uh, Mavi Garcia's team. Uh, we talked a lot about Mavi Garcia on the last episode. And also Marta Bastianelli. Um, and they were uh, two separate teams for the past few years. Ale Cipollini... Um, and BTC Ljubljana and uh, now the license is still with Ale Cipollini they've become they became one team at the beginning of this season I don't think we've hardly ever spoken about them to be honest because they don't have those kind of marquee names apart from uh, Marta Bastinelli of course Um, but they I was looking at their record this year and they've um, got a top 10 in eight of the 11 races that they've raced. That includes five podiums and one win at the Vuelta CV Feminas. Um, so I think they're really promising. They have a really good range. Um, and I think for the races coming up, particularly the Giro, I think they're going to be really, really the team to watch. Yeah, they do. They do sort of fly under the radar a bit, don't they, compared to a lot of the other teams. It's a good point. Um, no, they actually, what is so um, crazy about how well they've done is at the end of last year, uh, when they were merging these teams, they actually lost um, all of the people that had won a race uh, that year. So that was like Chloe Hoskins, Soraya Paladin, uh, Swinkles and Yelena Erich. So all of them had won races that weren't national championship races and all of them left at the end of the year. So you would think that would just be absolutely the death knell for the success of the team. But I think they've really done well by bringing in Mavi Garcia, bringing in Marta Bastianelli uh, and bringing in Tatiana Goderzo. And uh, clearly it's reaping some real uh, success for them now. Obviously... The results have been split between Mavi Garcia and uh, Marta Bestinelli in terms of getting podiums, uh, but it just shows that if you have clear leaders in your team and they're very different riders from each other, then it you know makes it much easier to focus your efforts and to get some real results. Yeah, Bastianelli really did. St- it kind of again that also went under the radar a little bit. She started the season really well, didn't she? Um, Second at mm. Het Newsblad, yeah. um, and uh, a string of like seconds and, and a first place there at the start before racing was was stopped. She was tenth at Strada Bianchi, but you know we were talking about La Course. Look out for her. I think she'd be a she'd be a great mm, candidate absolutely. for that for that race on that course. So that's your team, Rose. What about your rider, Orla? Who are you going for? Well. Um, If we were going to be talking about riders winning races, we've talked about her a lot already, and I would repeat a phrase that has become a bit of a cliche of its own by now, which is, it's hard to see past Annemiek van Vluten. In fact, we could just clip that small section up and play it every time we're talking about a race for the foreseeable future. It's hard to see past Annemiek van Vluten. We could add music to it and make it a bit of a jingle. (laughs) Um, I mean, I would say that 
even though we've become so expectant of wins from her, she's moved into another level even for Van Vluten. If she were an animate Van Vluten video game, she'd been one of those bonus rounds by now, a hidden world or something that other players share secret tips about amongst each other to try to get access to. I think that's a thing in We've gaming. gone into gamer, another world. Yeah. You've had too much <laughs> well, time that, at Legoland, yeah. maybe. Well, yeah. <laughs> maybe that is it. But anyway... I'm not going for Annemiek van Vluten. I'm not going for Mavi Garcia, even though I'm really excited about her. I'm not going for Anna van der Breggen, who um, has had a fantastic uh, restart after COVID, I think, given that she's not even planning to peak until September. Um, my pick... Given that, given that she didn't touch her bike throughout lockdown. My pick... I just made, I just made that up. <laughs> my pick is going to be... Um, Another performer from Strada Bianchi, and that's the young Kiwi rider for Equipe Paul Ka, Michaela Harvey. Um, she's only 21. She was the youngest in the top 30 at Strada Bianchi. She won the under 23 category. Even the fact that she finished when only 45 riders did in total and 78 either didn't or didn't make the time cut would have been notable. But she finished 12th, just outside the top 10. And this is only her second season as a pro. She had two top 20s in the Spanish one day races coming in into Strada. She finished second in the New Zealand National Time Trial this year behind Ella Harris and she really just seems to be thriving now that she's over racing in Europe full time. She did show signs of it last year as well. She took a stage win at the Tour of Britannia Femina beating um, Audrey Cordon Rigaud, Cecily Trip Ludwig, Clara Koppenberg. So no sloppy field there and that was in her first season as a pro. Um, so I think it'll be really interesting to see how she gets on this year and especially actually at the Giro Rosa if she decides to ride that or if they put her up for that she uh, wore the young rider's white jersey on stage one last year after Katusha Bigla as they were there and came second on the team time trial and of course this year we've got a team time trial on the first stage again followed by all we know about the second stage is it will be a Strada Bianchi style um, stage. So we know that she can perform in that. We don't know anything else about the rest of the course as yet, but it could be an incredibly strong start for her. Um, she has signed a contract extension at Polka after Strada, which is obviously a sign of their confidence in her and that kind of stability now that she has a team that has been saved as well, could well be a place for her to thrive. And I really just think it's good to have some young talent to talk about as well. I mean, we've mentioned this already about the the experienced riders being the ones who tend to thrive these days. Um, so, yeah, it's, I think it's just refreshing to have another name, a young name in the mix as well as the likes of Cecily Trip Ludwig and Leanne Lippert. So Michaela Harvey is the rider that I'm going to be watching out for um, for the rest of this season and um, the years to come. I think she's a very exciting young talent. I think it is. It adds more um, shame that we didn't get to see what was going on in Strada Bianchi past uh, Anna Meek winning and coming across the line because I would have loved to have seen how that developed that Michaela made it up to 12th place uh, because the company that she's in in that position is just extraordinary. The fact that she's um, just one in front of Amanda Spratt and just behind Marta Bastianelli um, and just ahead of Leanne Lippert. That, I mean, that's incredible company to be in, but it's just unfortunate that we never got to see how that developed and how it came to be because she wasn't in that, you know, they had that quite selective group um, that was just behind uh, Mavi Garcia and Annemiek van Floyten. And then they actually ended up way back and it would have been great to see um, a talent like Michaela Harvey come through and how she how she did it. And certainly her team um, are, you know, obviously committed for another few years till 2024 and they are signing up riders left, right and centre and putting a lot of the riders on longer contracts and so on. So um, that must be good for morale within that team, I would guess, as well. They're putting their money where their mouth is um i joked about um anna van der bregen not touching her bike during the uh the pause in racing it would be refreshing wouldn't be wouldn't it if a rider said you know if we asked them you know how what did you do during lockdown how did you train and they just said oh i, I didn't touch my bike mate i uh, i just <laughs> i just i just took it easy put my Is feet up for a few of... months i was gonna say that sounded suspiciously uh, australian oh, generic, to begin with generic that, that australian yeah, um, generic i didn't touch my mark would it be refreshing, Richard, or would would it be thoroughly it'd be unprofessional? 
I think it would be I mean, great. I it'd mean, be, would you be, be refreshed fa- be by that? I would you think. Experiment. Catch a grip. Be an experiment. That's your job. Get see on with they, it. Yeah. See how, see how they got on. <laughs> yeah, see what a couple anyway. of months just sitting around eating Doritos would do for your career. There you go. Richard, this sounds like a great sporting, sporting event. <laughs> Richard's right, cycling all, race where you, it, you don't have to do any <laughs> training. It's we're, all a we're, bit too serious, isn't it? It's all a, <laughs> yeah. that, is that what you're thinking when you're on the bike, Richard? Yeah. Instead of Swifting, just play video games. You don't need yeah, to pedal yeah. them. No. no. Fortnite no, or something. Pa- I played Pac-Man. <laughs> you can play that Fortnite. game that Orla was talking Fortnite's about earlier about with, with the... Yeah, with you can play the anime Clan Bulletin video yeah, game. Yeah, 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 yeah try to get into that secret level that... that Anime yeah, the secret, yeah, the secret level. So I can't ride anyway, my bike, but I've made it into this bonus world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. enough silliness. Um, something more serious. Um, I spoke to Bob Varney recently. He runs uh, Drops Team, of course. And just let's hear a little bit from him because uh, he, his team were invited to, to take part in the Tour de France virtual, the um, the the watch online platform. Was it on Zwift? I can't remember. I think it was on Zwift, wasn't it? The... Um, the, the, yeah, the virtual Tour de France. And uh, they won two of the stages. April Tacey, another young rider, just 19 years old. And she won two of the stages. And that, that garnered them a lot of publicity and a lot of attention. Um, a surprising amount. At least it was surprising to me, actually, when I spoke to Bob about that and about their search for a sponsor to enable them to go into the world tour. That's their ambition. You've been... Uh, on social media quite a lot, you know, making it clear that you are looking for a sponsor and looking to, to go bigger. I mean, obviously, why not? I guess that's been a perennial search, but is there anything that's made it more urgent this year, apart from COVID? Um, that's a, it's a good question. It's a perennial search because you don't get multi-year deals uh, or very few multi-year deals in women's cycling. So that's always been our biggest problem. You know, you can't have riders on multi-year deals. You've got, you know, it, it's been a huge frustration. So we don't have a title sponsor, so we want one. We thought that once we got a wild card for the Tour de France Virtual, that that was a good opportunity for us to showcase what we do to the world. So we had a bit of a plan that we would try to be, you know, a bit disruptive in that race and try and do stuff. And then, of course, by winning two stages and having the polka dot jersey and the young jersey for pretty much the whole race by the last stage, we kind of did that and everyone wanted to know who drops were. So we kind of thought we'd capitalise upon that by telling the world who we were and what we wanted. We want to pay all of our riders. We want them all to have maternity pay. We want our full-time staff. We want a full-time doctor. So how do you package all of those things in an easy to understand kind of package for a marketing director and that is a world tour license because all of those things are criteria in a world tour license you've known me since the beginning we've always been super ambitious the one thing that's held us back is really getting that level of you know investment in the team that's been enabled to to keep our riders um, our good riders and pay them the salaries they deserve and have regular staff so we thought that was an easy way for that to be understood by the broader kind of audience that we were then kind of um, exposed to during that period. It's interesting you say that the, the virtual tour did, you know, did, did its job, that, that, that it did generate a lot of interest in the team. Was that your experience and did that exceed expectations? You obviously did very well, but did you find that, that it really did sort of punch through and, and resonate with people? Massively, absolutely massively, yeah. It was probably more so than the real racing. Why is that? The, because it had the Tour de France well, badge the on it. Tour de France. It. Mm. That's why ASO is so powerful. That's why the Tour de France is so powerful. It is the most powerful brand in cycling, isn't it? Yeah. No, that's interesting. Every Everyone knows the yellow jersey. Everyone knows the Tour de France. You know, everybody, even people that have no interest in cycling, know something about the Tour de France. So that's why ASO is so powerful, and that's why the Tour de France is the richest race in the world. So to have a wild card, to be one of 16 women's teams in that, I can't, it weren't rocket science to know that that was going to get a huge amount of interest, especially in a global pandemic where there was no real sport going on. Have there been any, any nibbles on that? Any, any progress? Yeah, there has. Um, it, it was really encouraging. We had lots of interest and lots of support, which is, was good for the soul, I must admit. And I think it would be fair to say we've got three or four ongoing conversations continuing um, of which one is slightly more advanced 
perhaps than the others. You know, I would say it's no more than 50-50. It could go either way. And that's a, a global brand that reached out to us and, you know, we presented to them and we've had conversations with them and the ball's in their court now. Um, and we're trying not to get too kind of excited because we've had some disappointments in the past. But that could happen. It might not happen. You know, I think it could go either way. But they are certainly looking at that in, in a serious way and it is the global business that's looking at all the facts and figures and we, we're able to do our presentation and our pitch to them and, and that's all we can ask for is to put our, our, our story across to uh, you know a suitable partner so we did that and we're waiting to hear back um, and then we've got two other conversations which we're, are ongoing I've got a conversation on Thursday on one of them and now still ongoing I'll probably put those at slightly less than 50-50 that's 40% chance perhaps so yeah we're, we're doing a, we're trying really hard to, to get one of them over the line but we'll have to see Richard well that was Bob Varney um, talking about their search for sponsor and the well I was surprised at just how much of a difference it seemed to make to them um, having that success in the Tour de France virtual um, which you know uh, I felt that the interest in that form of racing had kind of peaked by then but I think what he found was that the, the power of the, the Tour de France brand was so enormous and this links to the conversation we were having earlier when you were asking Orla which would be kind of rise to the top of the hierarchy in women's cycling I think an event or a stage race organized by ASO would have a real head start you know just for that that reason alone um that it would it would have everything in its favor to become the sort of premier stage race for women I do agree to a certain extent but I think a big part of the success of the women's virtual Tour de France was the fact that it was at the same time as the men's you know and that um, it was it was just a full day of racing so it was very very easy um, to link the two to understand the two if you were into the men's race then there was no point in not watching the women's race you know it just it just made sense as one whole package and I think the fact that it was packaged as such was also very powerful because it was it was saying the women's race is equal to the men's and that's all in the in the message that you're sending out as much as anything else and I think if you were to talk about um the public perception and the much wider perception as to which one would be the more prestigious than the logistical impossibility which would be running a woman's Tour de France at the same time as a men's Tour de France I think would achieve that you know and it would be what Bob was talking about in terms of um, bringing the, the brand of the Tour de France on board of the women's race however having it at a different time I don't think um, certainly beyond the cycling bubble will pierce through quite so much. I think people will sit back and say, oh, that's great, they've got it now. I'm not sure whether that will still make them tune in. I don't know. I mean, that, the reason that the uh, Giro Rosa is positioned in the calendar where it is is exactly like you were saying about the uh, virtual Tour de France being at the same time as the men because in Italy they play the Tour de France live, the men's Tour de France live, and then they play the highlights of the Giro Rosa and then they obviously get a really big ratings hit then because people are still tuning in from watching the Men's Tour de France. But would they independently be watching the Giro Rosa if it was somewhere else in the calendar? And, I mean, it's, it, the people outside of Italy don't have that privilege of watching the Giro Rosa straight after the Tour de France and therefore they don't watch it. So it is exactly, I think, what you're saying, Ola, that it's the positioning of it being exactly the time, same time as the men's means that it gets a lot of coverage or a lot of attention. And without that, I don't think the race organisation by itself means that it will get more coverage just because it's got, you know, ASO slapped on it. I think th what you're talking about, Richard, as well, um, if it were to come the day after the men's Tour de France, you know, that also comes with its own conflict because, yes, we have peak cycling interest in the in the sport and also beyond. However, then it also serves as quite a strong contrast with what has come before, doesn't it? And, 
you know, if we don't have the same crowds on the side of the road, if we don't have the same media coverage, which we absolutely won't because there's nothing like the Tour de France, we won't have the same journalists on the ground. Whatever broadcasters or newspapers do have a presence will not be um, their premium team because they're at the Tour de France because it's the biggest bike race in the world and the concern then what I hate seeing is whenever people say oh you know there's just not an audience for it that's why it's not catered for and you don't want to feed into that because to me that's absolute BS you've got to create the the event and create the momentum and the platform and then tell us if and and, and sponsorship and money and all the rest of it investment then see if there's an audience for it um, and I would hate for that to um, just be an easy uh, victory for the naysayers if that's not too cynical a way of saying it um, so I don't think it's as simple really as having a women's tour de France or the equivalent thereof and that becoming the most exciting race I don't think anybody's I'm certainly not suggesting a women's tour de France but I think that a, a stage race for women organised by ASO if they if they put their muscle behind it and and even their infrastructure and, and all the resources that they have, um, it would be, a, it would it would be a, a big event, and it would, and I think that you know for for people who spend three weeks watching the tour, it becomes such a habit, and there's such a there's such a, a kind of people are in such a downer when the, the Tour de France finishes that you know that. Um, to have a, a race then then start and, and often okay not so much recently perhaps but often the tour has 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 kind of you know been done and dusted with with a week or so to go when there's when there's a dominant rider there's a there's a, a lack of interest as the tour reaches Paris or interest drops off and to have another race starting it might well attract quite a big audience but I think that you know, when you we, we spoke a lot this week about the the tour of Poland and the awful crash with Fabio Jakobsen and and the fact that men's some men's world tour races are are just not of a stand of the standard that they should be, and it, you go to an ASO race and it and it is of a high standard in terms of organisation and infrastructure and the look and the presentation and everything else, and if they brought that to a, a women's stage race that they are starting, they're setting up that it's in their interest for it to be a success. You know, they're not setting up to fail. It could be, it could be really good. You know, it could be, it could be a real, it could become a real force on the calendar, I think. But I mean, our experience of ASO races is, uh, our men's races, aren't they? And if they do have a women's race, it's a women's race that's tagged on to the men's race, like Liege Baston Liege or uh, Flesh Wallonne. Those are both women's, ASO races but those are just tagged on to men's race so yeah it would have to depend on how much effort they put into it I mean they haven't put you say it's in their interest to do a really good job but then they hardly give uh, live TV pictures of the women's race of races on courses that the men are going to do later in the day that they have stationary cameras already set up on and they don't put in the effort enough to give us that so why would they put in a load of effort to make a really spectacular professional polished uh, women's stage race I would be happy to start giving them the benefit of the doubt if only because they are going to do it and I, and I would hope it would be mm. a success oh, regardless yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and also I was really heartened by the fact that um, the staging a, a woman's pyro bay because that came from absolutely nowhere there was next to no pressure about that um, it's not one of the races that has been you know, high on the priority list to to get a woman's race for Richard. You're pulling faces there, but I don't think many. Well, I don't I think many. It, yeah. Well, not many of the not many of the teams, not many of the riders. In fact, none of the riders that that I know of expected that announcement. It wasn't like it had come from years of campaigning the way the way the women's Tour de France um, has been. So I would think that for that maybe maybe they like we've said for a long time that you know they can't afford to be on the wrong side of history with this you know women's sport is evolving it's changing it's getting bigger and it has to it, for so many reasons it has to so me, I'm happy to give them the benefit of the doubt that they are finally seeing the light and see what they make of this but you know the pressure is on they have to do it right they have to do it right there's no other option after after everything that has gone into it and all the political pressure that's gone into it and and what it means for women's racing in the wider world. They have to do this properly. And, and you know, we'll be watching very closely to make sure that they do. 
Indeed. Um, just a little update on Ashley Moulin Passio, who had a terrible crash at Strada Bianchi. Um, she, we talked about that in the last episode, but yeah, she hit a bump on the downhill of the last gravel section and handlebars dropped. It was the, it was while wrecking the course actually the day before. A very high speed crash on the gravel. Um, she's not sure she'll be riding La Course, but she is back on the road and uh, says she will certainly be at the Giro Rosa. So that is going to be her big target, it seems. Um, before we go, um, our fantastic clothing from Katusha is available. The jerseys are available. Looks beautiful. Um, I loved your modelling. Sliders and socks, Thank you, Richard. Thank, yeah, thank I haven't you. received one yet, actually, very, Richard. Strangely, very fashionable, apparently. The, the sliders and socks. Yeah, it is. Um, That's got why I'm a lot impressed. Of, a lot of a lot of derogatory comments. Oh, on not at all. Media, but, I mean, I, I should say um, I've been staying on staying on Danish campsites, so um, my idea of what's fashionable <laughs> right now is perhaps slightly different. Um, uh, but I would wear sliders excellent. and socks every day. Absolutely. Well. I mean, cyclists always. I don't, I'm not. I don't know where this word sliders came from. They're fl- they're kind of they're sandals. Oh, I call them sliders. I've never heard. They're I've never sliders, heard sliders. Yeah. Oh, get with That was a new one on me. Flip flops anyway, have the si- bit between the toes. Cyclists. Sandals have straps. In the 1980s, every cyclist wore that kind of footwear. I know, and you know what the funny thing is? It's 2020. Yeah, I was going to say. Go I figure. don't think anyone is dressing <laughs> well, like a, a 1980s cyclist anymore. <laughs> Uh, well, have if, you got the mullet? In the mullet, in the nineteen eighties, I mean, forty on. years ago, that's when yeah, everybody wore. Also, and I can't understand how fashionable. No, not even just it's forty also, years ago, but forty years ago, a really specific okay. group of sweaty men <laughs> wore. That. Question, question: What is the most stylish cycling jersey of all time? Aqua blue. Without, it's not even a debate. <laughs> Aqua blue. It's so Lavi Claire. It. It's Lavi Claire. Oh no, that's, what do you that's never, not never been better. Have you? It's definitely up for debate. Richard, Richard, for Richard debate. you find me a picture of someone wearing Lavi Claire with socks and sliders. I don't. I okay. don't think I've ever seen it. I, I don't. Orla, I I'm gonna. I'm gonna spend. I'm gonna spend far far too much time trying to do just that. <laughs> oh, and I, I and I'm already regret. I'm already regretting that. Anyway. um Rose, have you have you managed to oh fact check Do your you know Edmondson thinking. siblings yet? I was thinking when you I tried that, that, and oh, I couldn't wait, wait, find wait. it. I've actually I've unplugged. It can't be that difficult. I've unplugged my mouse as well. Well, it would so only be difficult if it didn't if it <laughs> wasn't true. <laughs> um, our 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 jerseys made by um, Katusha they are, beautiful, are available beautiful. at thecyclingpodcast.com. dot com. If you uh, go to shop there, uh, you will see. So Annette, Annette Edmondson rode for Orica. In actually, I literally just spent all this time and he just pipes up at the last minute. Well, I, I'm just showing how easy it is to check oh, it. Oh, okay. he's just well, trying. Well, Edmondson and Alex Edmondson were, on, were both at Orica, not at the same time, though. I hate to tell you, is that so? Yeah, she was there 2013 2014 and he was there 2016. Ah, oh. So, to go back to the news roundup that um, started um, this episode, um, Emma Norsgaard's brother, Matthias, rides for the men's movie star squad, making it a family affair, and it means that it's the first time that a brother and sister have ridden on the same team together. There's, there's also a brother <laughs> and sister at rally cycling. World tour, oh. then I should have clarified. Anyway, that's a, <laughs> that's a dynamic note on which to end this particular yes. rumble. Don't we agree? <laughs> Great. Any other corrections, just send them in. Um, or just I'm don't. off to Google <laughs> La- Lavi Claire sliders. Sliders and socks. Oh, sliders, You, you do sandals, Richard, and we'll see how long it takes you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Until next month. A sandal can month. be kitten heel. Now that I would like to see. Yes. Ne- next well, month Richard we'll be talking about because <laughs> I really would like to see that <laughs> have you not yet oh it's a sight to behold oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to burn my eyes out so I wouldn't want to do that it would though the, it would do it for the, you it's on the dark web it's on the dark web <laughs> oh, God. anyway uh, that's all for now uh, thank you very much Orla thank you very much both and thank you Rose thanks very much you guys